Welcome to Market Matters, our markets podcast on making sense, the hub for J.P. Morgan corporate and investment bank podcasts. In each episode of Market Matters, we discuss the latest news and trends shaping markets today. Hi, I'm Edwina Lowe, product specialist within the Data Assets and Alpha Group here at J.P. Morgan. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Krupa Patel, who runs our international market intelligence team and is a regular feature on this podcast series. Today, we're going to discuss the outlook for international versus US equities post the recent market developments. So Krupa, thank you so much for being here again. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Edwina. So let's dive straight in. Since we recorded our last podcast with you, which was about six weeks ago, there have been a number of important developments, both on the macro and micro front, which have driven some massive moves across many markets, both from a cross-asset and cross-regional perspective. Could you start by setting the scene and laying out what's happened in markets over the last month or so? Of course. So as you say, there's been a number of important developments on both the macro and micro front in markets over the last month. So quite a lot has happened. So starting with the US, the immaculate disinflation narrative there has actually gathered further steam on the back of this really sharp improvement that we've had in the US growth data, and of course, a rapid fall as well in CPI down to 3%. The labor market has actually stayed tighter than many were expecting. And if you look at macro surprises in the US as well now, they are now at the highest level in over two years. And then, of course, you've had China stimulus announcements, quite a few of those, across both the property and consumer industries in particular in the last few weeks. On the central bank front, again, there have been a number of important developments. Of course, the Fed and ECB had a dovish set of press conferences, but then that was followed by a fairly hawkish Bank of Japan meeting where they announced the YCC policy tweak, but then that was followed by two unscheduled bond buying operations. Then, of course, last week, we had the Fitch's U.S. debt rating downgrade, followed by the Treasury's refunding announcement. And then, of course, uh, U.K. inflation eased a fair bit over the last few weeks. But Bank of England stayed firmly hawkish, despite markets getting increasingly dovish regarding the near-term policy path. And then... If I look at what Europe's macro data has been doing, quite interestingly, in the last few weeks, there have been some tentative signs of a potential bottom forming in Europe's macro surprise index. And then, of course, on the micro front, there's been the Q2 earnings season, which has actually pointed to a still relatively strong corporate profitability trend shaping up across most of the DM world. Well, it's certainly fair to say a lot has been going on. And could you now expand on how markets have reacted to this news flow? And where have we seen the biggest moves? Yeah, so the biggest moves have actually been across global bond markets in the last few weeks, particularly treasuries. So the longer dated yields, particularly the 30-year bond yield in the US, is now back to levels that were last seen in October. And the yield curves as well have actually steepened quite sharply. Then you've had oil, which has seen some pretty big moves as well. So Brent has been approaching April highs on the Saudi production cut headlines. So that's been the other major development from a market standpoint. And quite interestingly, despite all of this that has happened in the bond markets, global equities have actually weathered it fairly well. So MCI World, for instance, which is a pretty good proxy for DM equities, that's down less than 2.5% from the 15-year highs that it hit at the end of July. And in fact, EM equities have been very resilient, with Chinese and Hong Kong stocks actually rebounding by nearly 6% from their July lows on the back of all these stimulus announcements that we've had in the last few weeks. Very interesting. Thank you. And could we look at the US specifically? It appears as though the US equity bull market that we've been in since the start of the year is starting to hit some roadblocks. Where do you think we go from here based on our broader team's data toolkits and views? Yeah, I mean, our broader team's view based on our positioning data and fundamental analysis is that in the very near term, i.e. in the next few weeks, you could actually see a small tactical pullback in US equities given this really strong hedge fund buying and the sharp short squeeze that we've seen recently. And of course, technicals were overstretched as well. But beyond that, I see no reason to turn bearish on global equities here, given the still strong macro and corporate fundamentals that we have. And it's a view that both John Schlegel and Andrew Tyler in our team discussed in their podcast in mid-July as well. Now, if yields keep rising, 
of course, we may need to reevaluate this medium term bullish view. But as of now, there is little evidence to suggest that inflation is making a comeback strong enough to hurt growth sentiment here. And from our side, we view the recent sell off in bonds as largely a function of the market getting over optimistic about the prospect of Fed rate cuts later this year and early next year. Thank you, Krupa. And if we could now compare views on the US versus international markets, you've appeared on several podcasts throughout the year discussing your views on China and Europe. Where do you stand today? Yeah, so let's just start with Europe first. Now, I've been cautious on Europe versus US equities for a good part of this year. And I still see no reason to turn bullish here. I think the relative growth, inflation and policy differentials between Europe and the US that I was bearish on this trade for still actually stand true. And when it comes to the China stimulus as well, I don't think it's going to be a game changer for not just the medium term Chinese growth trajectory, but also for European equities. And I understand the temptation to add European exposure here on the back of these really cheap relative valuations that we've gotten back down to. But I would note that positioning in European equities is actually still fairly elevated. And if you look at the stock 600, at its highest point last week, it was less than 5% away from the record highs. So it's barely priced in any of the growth slowdown that we'd seen over the last three to four months. And then similarly for China, Yes, relative valuations are also near historical lows here. And yes, hedge fund selling in the region has been severe prior to the stimulus announcements. But global investor appetite to rotate into Chinese and Hong Kong equities and out of US equities is still quite limited. Investors, I think, are now saying, show me the growth. Something which I think is unlikely to materialize if I look at our economists' projections who still see the economy delivering a pretty lackluster GDP growth profile for the rest of this year. Thank you, Krupa. That's very clear. And if we could turn to Japan, I know that this has been an outlier to your generally bearish stance on international versus US markets. And to that end, you and I recorded a podcast specifically on Japan in April this year. Do you remain bullish on Japanese equities in light of the recent BOJ YCC tweak? Yes, I do. Now, we were factoring in a Bank of Japan policy tweak at some point this year for a while now. And like we'd been saying since the start of the year, barring the initial negative knee-jerk reaction, the Bank of Japan ultimately exiting its YCC policy should be a positive for not just the Japanese economy, but also the stock market. I think what this YCC tweak, which eventually could result in the Bank of Japan exiting this policy and eventually even negative interest rates, could mean that the Japanese economy and its policy trajectory is continuing to progress towards a more normal inflationary and policy cycle after the decades of deflation this economy has suffered from. And from a more near-term perspective as well, I think it's interesting that the reaction of the Bank of Japan's YCC flexibility announcement at the end of July hasn't actually had a significant adverse impact on the topic so far. So it's only fallen by around 2.5%, for instance, from its 33-year highs that it hit a few weeks ago. So overall, I see no reason to turn bearish on Japanese stocks here, as all the structural factors I was bullish on the market for still hold true. Thank you, Krupa. So I'd like to try and summarise your views. Despite the slight wobble that we've had in equity markets over the last few weeks, you continue to believe in the case for US exceptionalism over international markets. This, you think, is particularly true for Europe and Chinese markets, where you believe the fundamentals continue to look challenging versus the US. On the other hand, Japan remains the only outlier to your bearish view on international equities, with the economy's structural transformation still at the heart of your bullish narrative for the region. Does that correctly summarise your views? Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Great. Thank you so much for being here again today, Krupa. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you also to our listeners for tuning into this bi-weekly podcast series from our group. We'd love to hear feedback on our content and to hear about other topics you would like covered. So if you have feedback, questions, or if you'd like to explore our wider team content further, please go to our website, jpmorgan.com forward slash market dash data dash intelligence. And there you can send us a message via the contact us form. And with that, we will close. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to Market Matters. If you've enjoyed this conversation, we hope you'll review, rate, and subscribe to J.P. Morgan's Making Sense to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. The views expressed in this podcast may not necessarily reflect the views of J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. and its affiliates. Together, J.P. Morgan. They are not the product of J.P. Morgan's research department and do not constitute a recommendation, advice, or an offer or a solicitation to buy or sell any security or financial instrument. This podcast is intended for institutional and professional investors only and is not intended for retail investor use. It is provided for information purposes only. Referenced products and services in this podcast may not be suitable for you and may not be available in all jurisdictions. J.P. Morgan may make markets and trade as principal in securities and other asset classes and financial products that may have been discussed. For additional disclaimers and regulatory disclosures, please visit www.jpmorgan.com forward slash disclosures forward slash sales and trading disclaimer. For the avoidance of doubt, opinions expressed by any external speakers are the personal views of those speakers and do not represent the views of J.P. Morgan.